Hi everybody, this is Morihiko Nakahara, music director at the South Carolina Philharmonic. And I'm so uh, uh, pleased to be joined today by Adela Watkins, who is the executive director of Columbia Museum of Art. Uh, thanks for joining me, Adela. Very happy to be with you. And uh, we're here to specifically uh, talk a little bit, little bit about uh, the, the amazing exhibit that is happening at the museum. And and how that uh, exhibit relates to our upcoming concert uh, at the Cougar uh, Center on, on March 20th, which is called Bach and Stravinsky. Uh, but uh, when I was building this program during the pandemic, uh, of course, and I thought, and I always look, you know, over the years, uh, all of the wonderful programming that, that occurs at the museum, um, you know, has been a source of inspiration for me in many ways, um, because you know I like to find you know little connections whenever whenever possible between sort of the music and the and the visual art and so on. So when I saw that you you were going to be having this big exhibit of Escher, I thought this this might be a, a perfect opportunity uh, to do some music of Bach and also introduce some. Uh, some of the neoclassical works, as we call it, uh, by Stravinsky and German Talaferre, who who was uh, the leading leading composer uh, of the early or early twentieth century um, as well. So, Della, if, um, I'm no expert when it when it comes to Escher, but uh, we we were talking earlier about um, sort of the deep connection really between Escher and Bach, and so. Maybe you could talk a little bit about about that, and you know how how maybe how that might um, re uh, relate to sort of the signature style of uh, assuring his art. Well, well, first of all, I'm delighted you were inspired during the pandemic by uh, the visual work of, of Escher. You know, as an art teacher, and then later as a museum director, to to see work like this. Um, in a chronological fashion here at the museum has really shown me how Escher sort of developed and thought. And as I started learning about this, I will admit to you right now that I had very little knowledge of his love of concerts and how he so, um, he journaled about it, what concert he went to and what he felt and what he heard. And then as he was working, he would also um, concentrate on every part of box music and then he would pick out irregularities or organization or repetitions and then that would inspire his work so you know we have six rooms here at the museum over a hundred and and about 138 uh, prints that you know once the music goers hear the concert i hope they'll come over and see the exact same sort of visual manipulation uh, of of sort of these uh, symmetry things that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So as I was, you know, doing some research too, and I didn't know this. You know, my I think my first real um, introduction to Escher. I can't remember how old I was. Um, you know, and uh, notoriously I'm colorblind, and. But it works well with Escher's works. Maybe that's why I was, maybe that's why I was, you know, compared to like impressionistic painting or something. And, you know, there's a, I still remember when I, when my wife and I first went on our first date, it was at the, uh, one of the impressionistic exhibit that was hosted at the Columbia Museum of Art. And oh. she, she didn't know I was, she didn't know I was colorblind. And we were in front of, we were in front of a painting and she said, isn't that, is, is, isn't this fascinating how they, you know, you see where there, there are two, two men in this image and I'm looking at this painting and I'm thinking, I see one guy, where's uh -oh. the other guy? <laughs> so, so I said, you know, it's funny because I only see one guy and that's when she realized I was colorblind. Um, well, but listen, any, if, that's, yeah. if that's your only fault, it must have been a great day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with with Escher, uh, when I was still when I was uh, growing up in Japan, and it was not so it was it wasn't that close to where where I grew up, but it was on the same big island. 
I grew up on the island of Kyushu, which is the western uh, western Big Island uh, in Japan, and uh, that's where Nagasaki is. And Nagasaki was known for you know, throughout during the isolationist period, uh, you know, during the 17th, 18th part of the 19th century, it was Japan's only window to the outside world because they were, mm -hmm. and a lot of the a lot of the interaction happened with the Dutch. So there was a oh, yeah. big Dutch theme park outside of Nagasaki. Oh. And I remember my grandmother would often, uh, we would often go there together. And I still have this handkerchief uh, that she bought me. And it's it's a reprint of one of uh, Escher's uh, arts. So it was, it was wow. sort of, and there was, I think there was some whole bunch of other Escher related things at that particular, uh, you know, theme park, uh, Dutch theme park. Uh, Aside from the tulips, you know, there were all these like other things like and one, oh, yes. was, one was focused on Escher. And so, you know, I still have that handkerchief to this day. So that's why I was really excited that um, you were going to be bringing in this uh, exhibit to Colombia. And then I, you know, did a little bit of research because, I, I, you know, I thought, well, my first thought when I was thinking about Escher and sort of my impressions of his work. Naturally, the minds, you know, a lot of our minds go to music of people like Philip Glass or, or Steve Wright. Mm -hmm. So these are sort of minimalists. So these were of a lot of American composers, but although composers all, all around the world as well, these are composers who took on, sort of elaborated on the, the, the smallest possible units. It might be oh, yeah. a little little lick, you know, little, little motif. And through repetition, they will create a sense of drama and so sense of structure. And so that was sort of a, a natural place that, you know, I initially went. And but when I was as I was, you know, thinking about this and started looking into it, realized and I didn't know this that, you know, Escher was quite a, quite an avid uh, cellist. And he also learned the piano, I think, when he was a kid. But I think there's a photo of him. He had a little like string quartet that he formed with, with ah. his friends. And, you know, he played for fun, but he kept up with his cello chops into his, you know, into his adulthood. Um, and so that was, you know, that was interesting. And then I started reading all these quotes where he talks about the, especially some, some of the fugues written yeah. by Bach. And mm -hmm. especially, I apparently love these, you know, and, you know, if you've ever been to these big cathedrals uh, with magnificent, magnificent pipe organs, and that was sort of his thing. He would go listen to a, a organ performance in a church, and he, he would talk about how the world all around him would just mentally just crumble away. And he's just seeing this magnificent structure architecture mm -hmm. so to speak of the pipe organ and listening to this uh amazingly constructed music of bach with 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 symmetry with repeating mm -hmm. patterns sort of sort of the perpetual motion of these phrases that or that are constantly being spun out uh with with manipulations um with and then that that creates the sense of drama and direction as well and he just would talk about how he felt his world was just everything else was just crumbling away and it was just him and this organ and music of bach you know in alone in the world and i thought well this is such a beautiful um sort of the way that one would think about music of bach and, and i can imagine him sitting there organizing it all in his head in imagery, which is which is the fascinating part. So, you know, and, and a lot of his work is in black and white. So it's simple, you know, and he has taken, you know, what, what he's famous, one of the things he's very famous for, the tessellations, which is a single unit, and then it is manipulated and turned or manipulated and, and angled and then repeating. So there's no space in between. So it's a continuum of just ideas. Now he took all kind of license with that, just like a composer will. 
and just begin to change it, turn it, invert it, reverse it, whatever he needed to do to make it visually interesting. But it always had a continuum and it always was going somewhere. So I can imagine him sitting there with music thinking, you know, it's progressing or it's, you know, whatever the great music word is meaning that. But you can see that visually in, in just about all his tessellations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, similar. And that's exactly the, the case with music of Bach or music of composers like in, in this instance, Stravinsky and Talafer from the early part of the 20th century who were very much interested in going back to the music of uh, people like Bach and kind of adding their own 20th century spin uh, to the to to their work, you know, it's sort of that's what sort of the, the spirit of neoclassicism in, in music. Uh, you know, what's amazing is that we often think of, you know, people would often talk about music of Bach being somewhat like mathematical. There's there's, mm -hmm. there's you can, one can one can look at his music and there's there's such a detailed, uh, intricate organization to it. The way he would write, arrange the pitches, the he, the way he would arrange the rhythm, how these rhythms are repeated, how the how the motifs are are, are repeated and layered, mm -hmm. and and inverted, and all of these things that he would do effortlessly. Yeah. But what's what to me sets up sets his music apart from a pure mathematical exercise or or sort of a esoteric exercise is that there's such a there's a, there's a, such a spiritual and 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 human aspect to to his music i think it's in some ways his music does have a lot of emotional drama in it if you if you look under the surface and that's sort of also one aspect that i kind of latched on with with you know with with works of escher too, because there, there is, and there, there is an element that is, one would say that can't just be done with, um, you know, with a computer <laughs> or, right. or some kind of a, yeah, some kind of a AI or something like that. I, you know, would, I don't think would be able to replicate the same kind of, same kind of effect that, that their, you know their works have, have on have on listeners or viewers. Uh, you know, well, well, you are right. The, the human hand is so evident in, in Escher's work, whether it's, you know, drawing or whether it's, you know, carving. I mean, it's, it's slow and it's intentional and it's developing. You know, it's just it, you're getting to an end. Um, and then the neat thing that I think also about the repetition, he's a printmaker. So he's not painting this one time. You know, he can print it. He can change it. He can print it again. He can change the color. He So I think that's another thing. Over his lifetime, you know, he probably made less than 500 originals, but he's printing all the time, different editions. And I think that's another thing about the repetition and order and, and neatness. You know, printmakers are very neat and, you know, very methodical. I think all of that from his medium to his thoughts. You know, he d does reflect and he loved music. So it it just ties it ties together beautifully. So I'm going to hear your concert. You've got to come see me yes. and yes. we'll be we'll be we'll cross pollinate our, our love and inspiration. Yeah. So how long is the uh, remind us how long the exhibit uh, will be at the uh, CMA? Well, the great news is because of the pandemic, I was able to get the lenders to go a little bit extra. Oh. So it is all the way through June the 6th. That's great. So, so yeah, so we have it here. Good, good, good springtime activity. Come see me. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be sure. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to uh, actually visit the exhibit myself yet. But well, what month is your anniversary? Uh, May. Oh. And actually, it would have been like early part of May <laughs> would, would 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 mark the anniversary of that. Okay, uh, well then. State, so, <laughs> yeah. We'll come back. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll have to make a visit together. And uh, this this time I'll have the advantage of, uh, you know, being a lot of things being black and white, which is basically <laughs> right. sort of. That's right. right. 
right right down my alley with yes. <laughs> with, with art. So yeah, Della, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with with us, and uh, yeah, we'll be sure to uh, check out the uh, exhibit as well. Thank you. Thank you.